Hi, I'm Paul Jay, and welcome to the Analysis.News podcast. Will efforts by the U.S. and governments around the globe to put the brakes on a deepening depression work? Is there a limit to how much stimulus the U.S. Treasury and the Fed can create? Has capitalism as we know it exhausted itself? If so, what's next? Now joining us to discuss all this is Leo Panitch. Leo is Emeritus Distinguished Research Professor of Political Science at York University in Toronto and co-editor of the Socialist Register in the current 2020 volume is Beyond Market Dystopia, New Ways of Living. His latest book is Searching for Socialism, the project of the labor new left from Ben to Corbin, written with Colin Lees. Thanks for joining us, Leo. Very happy to be here, Paul, and congratulations on the analysis. It's great. Thank you. So you've written about the role of the U.S. Treasury and Fed as what you call the manager of global capitalism, and you've questioned whether it could continue to play this role in a crisis during a Trump administration. So what's your assessment so far? Well, one has to say, it since the middle of March, uh, the Fed has been remarkably successful as the world central bank uh, in preventing a complete seize-up of the global financial system. Uh, what effectively has happened, and I'm not sure it's right to call it a deepening depression or to make the comparisons with war, as so many people are doing, because essentially what has happened is that the world states have shut down production. This isn't something that happened that was triggered by a financial collapse uh, or uh, very low growth rates. This, after all, is triggered by a terrible uh, pandemic, the kind we have not seen in a century. Uh, and uh, the world economy was essentially shut down. And insofar as financial markets began to see that was about to happen, especially in the United States, uh, they were seizing up. Uh, and what the Fed did remarkably uh, was to start doing things it had never done before, which was to buy uh, commercial paper, that is, the short-term uh, bonds that uh, corporations issue in order to balance out their cash flows, pay them back over 30 days or 90 days. Um, it started buying uh, uh, not only mortgages, as it did in 2008, but also municipal bonds, which is the largest bond market uh, at, at all. And, and the world's banks buy uh, the United States municipal bonds. And the Fed has always uh, refused to do that uh, because it would mean profligacy on the part of local governments, which don't have much tax base. So this is a way of disciplining them. And that's why New York went bankrupt in 1976, because the Fed wouldn't buy its bonds. Uh, the Fed is buying junk bonds. It's buying corporate bonds that have uh, below B rating. Um, and, and all these things are being done in the United States. But on top of all of that, it has uh, reinvigorated the swap relationships with the leading advanced capitalist state central banks and is providing them with dollars. Uh, and what this proves, again, is that even under the incompetence and confusion and mendacity of a Trump presidency, when uh, the world economy shudders, when capitalists fear uh, about the value of their property, they pile into the American dollar. Uh, and and uh, above all, the American Treasury bill, which is the core bond of the of the uh, American state. And that's because they know that the American government is above all dedicated to protecting property around the world. Uh, so it, it it is quite remarkable how the tread, which is the Fed, which has overseen some six trillion uh, dollars in liquidity being poured into the world system, 
uh, has managed to stabilize it. It looked like there would be a stock market collapse. Even the stock market has revived. Now, that said, the Treasury remains run by an effective idiot, um, and nothing like Robert Rubin in uh, the 1990s or, or Larry Summers uh, or Tim Geithner under Obama. Uh, the Treasury still has not replaced many of the key offices uh, that the Trump administration should have filled when it fired uh, the more progressive, quote unquote, uh, Obama appointees. Um, uh, as we know, the State Department has been bereft of, of so much of its uh, competence, speaking simply in, in the American state's own terms. And, and in the case of the Fed, the Trump appointed uh, lots of uh, pe- Trump appointed lots of people uh, to the various regional uh, and national Fed boards. But the Fed's autonomy, ironically, what we used to criticize as independent central banks, because it meant that central banks couldn't be told to loosen the purse strings uh, so that uh, governments could uh, engage in spending that wasn't austerity related. Now, the independence of central banks uh, is providing the lifeline from an administration like Trump's uh, to keep uh, the global financial system going at a time when production has been brought to a stop. How long can this go on for that you continue to keep the market's going yeah. through stimulus, through creating yeah. money, uh, when when production continues to more or less be stopped. And you look at the more recent uh, predictions from the CDC, and they're talking a year to two years before a vaccine. Uh, the, the CDC or someone in the CDC just yesterday said we haven't even, this is just the beginning of the pandemic. We're so far from a peak. Um, how yeah. much can they just keep creating this money. And then the second thing is, I, I, it's understandable that some of this money has to go to businesses to keep them going. But if, a, if, if to a large extent, the businesses are not continuing to pay people or laying people off and using the money to just pay off debt, which they incurred to a large extent through stock buybacks, um, then where does all this end up? Uh, yeah, th- th- this is, uh, these are the right questions to ask. Um, what, what the Fed is providing uh, is liquidity for the system to operate. But insofar as uh, production is interrupted for any considerable period of time, or even without it lasting as long, the lockdown, as you're speaking about, if demand doesn't revive when uh, the, the lockdown is over, uh, because people then will start need to paying their taxes. They'll start to have to start repaying the debt. Even businesses, small businesses, medium-sized businesses, large businesses will have to start repaying the debt uh, at that moment. Um, so they won't be buying from one another. Uh, at that question, it, at that time, it becomes not a liquidity crisis, but a cr- solvency crisis. Uh, and we just saw today that Uh, one of the most revered and largest of America's department stores, Neiman Marcus, has declared bankruptcy. Uh, So, yes, this is the right question to ask. Moreover, uh, you know, uh, it's a question as to whether uh, the relationship between the rest of the world, I was said that the Fed has been coordinating with the the central banks of the advanced capitalist countries, um, but uh, insofar as third world countries, developing countries, what used to be called third world countries, um, are uh, unable to meet their uh, interest payments, to roll over their debt to so all of the private investors who piled into both government and private uh, debt in third world countries because they weren't getting much of a return. Uh, in uh, fr- from uh, the interest rates in the advanced capitalist countries, they now want to pull their money out. Uh, and as a result, the IMF has canceled debt payments from a great many countries in the South, 
And the uh, Fed, again, has orchestrated through the G7, but especially the G20, uh, that uh, the bilateral loans from uh, richer countries to poorer countries uh, will ha- can be postponed, not canceled, but postponed. That said, the majority of the debt is owned by private uh, assets, uh, private companies, by banks, by investment banks, etc., and getting them to put a moratorium on the debt uh, is extremely difficult. And even if some of them agree to, not all of them will agree to, as happened with Argentina at the beginning of the uh, 21st century. So uh, it's not clear that even with all of this coordination, uh, the Fed will be able, be able to manage all of this. I have to say, one of the things that I think that we haven't been aware of uh, as we talk about this is that insofar as it hasn't collapsed yet, this does actually have to do with the regulations that were introduced after the 2008 crisis on the banks. By forcing them to keep more capital, what is called a capital adequacy, first in the United States and then together with other countries through what is known as the Basel Agreement, Uh, Both American banks and European banks uh, entered this crisis with more capital on hand uh, than uh, was the case in 2008, much more. And the result of that is uh, that they haven't called their loans, which would have led to a cascade of financial shutdowns. Whether they are actually now uh, leveraging what the government is uh, providing to them by buying mortgages off their hands, bonds off their hands, et cetera, municipal bonds off their hands, uh, whether they're actually leveraging that uh, and whether they will, you're right, in the fall or next winter to be lending further to Uh, mortgage holders, to companies, to corporations, is a very, very big question. Um, But it is remarkable, and it couldn't have happened without uh, the reforms that worked after 2008, that it hasn't been the banks that have been facing the crisis. If you go back to the countries that are not in the advanced capitalist world, uh, what you spoke about is their ability to borrow money and pay off debt. And even if the current debt is payments are postponed, those countries don't have the ability just to make up money the way the U.S. does. And to, to some extent, Europe, they need U.S. dollars. They have many of the countries have to import stuff. They don't even have enough food domestically often. Um, you're talking millions and millions and of people who are going to be destitute. Uh, the, the, if the, if they're going to manage global capitalism, they're they're going to have well, to deal the with, that, with that dimension. too. But yeah, absolutely, Paul, that's the moral. No, no, not, not just not not no 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 not just moral. What happens with a COVID virus running rampant through these countries? Yeah. It's not going to just stay there. Sure. Mass migration, try to get away from the destitution. It's not just a moral question. No, no, Paul, you're absolutely right. But I'm saying it is also the moral question. Uh, What I was posing is just in capitalist terms, uh, the actual managerial question. Uh, You're quite right to be raising all of this. Uh, And insofar as their exchange rates are collapsing, which they are vis-a-vis the dollar, it makes the cost of imports even more difficult. And insofar as the American state, but not only the American state, the Canadians, etc., are scrambling to get a hold of protect PPE as protection equipment uh, uh, from China and elsewhere, they are pricing out the ability of the poor countries of the world to get their own protection equipment. So the danger should the pandemic uh, explode in the global south in Africa, in Latin America, and it hasn't yet, 
it, it, all those factors enter into this. You're you're absolutely right. I was simply pointing to while it, while asking us to note that uh, the financial system has not collapsed. Uh, and, uh, and there hasn't been a run on the banks. Imagine if all that had happened on, on top of what's going on. I was also trying to note how great the problem is once you look at this globally, not just in terms of the advanced capitalist countries and in terms of the difficulty when even the G20, which includes China and Turkey, etc., cetera, uh, get together to try to cope with this to some extent because they can't control what private capital will do, what hedge funds will do, uh, et cetera. So, yes, now, once one raises the, uh, the dimension uh, that you're raising of the inequality and the dangers that this poses, uh, this also becomes... Uh, needs to enter into the equation inside the advanced capitalist countries themselves, where in many pockets, as we know of them, there are increasingly uh, third world conditions in any case, uh, and the degree of inequality is phenomenal. Uh, the ability of uh, the poor people in these countries, and when I say that, I mean, uh, you know, even the middle class, uh, to be able to resume consumption uh, is much limited by the fact that that, that consumption is debt-driven by virtue of the fact that it depends on them being able to get credit since uh, their wages have stagnated since the early 80s or late 70s. Um, and, and they haven't, in that sense, recovered uh, since they lost many of the assets that they held, uh, things like the, the, the houses, that they held and lost them during the crisis of 2008. And they don't then have the assets to roll over increased credit. So these are the enormous managerial challenges that capitalism is facing in, in face of this crisis. Uh, and, and, uh, but I, I think it needs to be stressed that this is a production crisis. This isn't something like in 2008 that was triggered by the speculation in finance. Uh, this is something that is comes right at the heart of any productive system that would close down. I mean, the irony of calling this a war is that what happens in a war is that production is ramped up, that you get economic planning even by capitalist governments in order to shift production from what is necessary, uh, 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 from what was necessary in a consumerized economy to what is necessary in a more wartime economy, and production is, is ramped up to the hilt. This financial system is seizing up now because this is a production crisis. And it just shows you the extent to which it's dependent, the financial system, on the productive system. Uh, and, and, and this is an enormous managerial problem for capitalist governments. Uh, and and I don't think there's going to be, even if uh, there is the end of the lockdown, a quick and easy recovery um, uh, because of the extent of the problem, because of the extent of reviving demand. If that is going to happen, it would require states to be taking the lead in uh, the types of public expenditure, fiscal expenditure, that would not just be tiding people over. But because so many firms will go bankrupt, uh, it would require the types of infrastructure programs that Trump was talking about when he got elected. Of course, because he's a developer, he's a builder, even if he had done it, which he hasn't, all he did was give tax breaks to the rich. If he had done it, it would have involved opening up public accumulation to uh, the developers, to the construction industry. Uh, now, uh, to some extent, that'll be done again by capitalist governments, but I don't think it'll be enough. Uh, and, and what will be required is the type of things that were envisaged in the Green New Deal. Um, but much, much more than that, in fact, the type of construction undertaken by the state itself 
by the Army Corps of Engineers, by the Works Project Administration uh, under the uh, Roosevelt New Deal, etc., cetera, uh, which uh, will be required in order to put enough people back to work and reestablish consumer confidence, but that could have the effect of undermining investor confidence uh, because it'll take the public sector to do it. Uh, and and the, the contradictions of this are absolutely immense. There is no doubt. They have essentially got themselves in a death spiral. Uh, when, I, when I'm talking now about lack of demand, like so much of this money is going not to people to spend and, and, and creating demand. So much of it's going, as I said earlier, just to finance debt of corporations, much of which was stock buybacks and such. Um, and, and it's just in these guys' nature. To, this crisis is an opportunity to make money even though they're cut, they're cutting their own throats. It's the nature of an economy and a state, which is dependent for production and employment, and for distribution, which includes distribution through some form of financial mechanisms, which is dependent on private firms that need to make a profit to do these things. You know, what we see, let's take the healthcare sector, just shows you how prescient the socialist campaign and the success of it under Sanders for a public, a completely universal public health system. Uh, the, the latest statistics on the fall in GDP in the United States, the fall in annual growth rates for the first quarter of this year, showed that the largest portion that went down, this is really remarkable, 40% of it, of the over 5% fall in growth rates, and by the, end, by the middle of the year, it'll be a 20% fall in growth rates. Doing very little to actually make sure their own bloody system works. I agree with you. And, and one of the most uh, uh, remarkable things that happened in, uh, during this lockdown and the pandemic and the massive bailout was that J.P. Morgan uh, paid a billion dollars on April 1st to take control of a Chinese asset management fund. Why on April 1st? Because the pressure from the Trump administration, but it was also pressure coming from all of the Democratic administrations before it on China to allow foreign uh, financial institutions to uh, fully control Chinese financial institutions was put into place on April 1st, as China promised as part of their arrangement uh, with the Trump administration. And on that day, J.P. Morgan's took a billion dollars and used it to buy out a, Chinese, a Shanghai uh, holding company, which had a minority share in this Chinese asset management firm. Uh, and, and it's remarkable uh, that, that uh, these guys would be doing this. It shows you the extent to which China is itself locked into this global capitalist system. Uh, there's no doubt that the fact that the government, the, the, the Fed, the government of Canada, the ECB, the European Central Bank, has to rely on BlackRock to buy up all of these assets that we began talking about in order to keep the financial system going because BlackRock has the expertise to do it. Nobody else has the expertise. So to buy up all these mortgages, to buy up all these junk bonds, to buy up the commercial paper, they, have, they are paying 
BlackRock and Larry Fink to do this. At the same time, Larry Fink has a uh, advisory firm, a financial markets advisory firm, which doesn't make a lot of money and he claims is watertight from their operations, which is advising governments around the world on the very questions you're asking me. So you're right. But what we see in this respect is how dependent these allegedly democratic states are on the expertise, on, on the very fact that it, the system operates at the financial level through these type of institutions. And then when you look at the productive institutions, in order to be able to get face masks produced, the government had to use a defense production law from the Korean War to force General Motors to do it or to be doing it via General Electric. And you see there that the state is dependent on the, these productive firms to produce this most essential stuff. And when you, me when you measure how the economy has seized up, it is fascinating to see that 40% of the fall in gross national product in the first quarter of the year took place in the healthcare sector in the United States. Well, how could that be? The only thing that's been kept going is the healthcare sector. How could that be? Well, the reason is that the private hospitals, that the hospitals in the United States, who char charge a, an arm and a leg and keep themselves going, they wouldn't be profitable otherwise through elective surgeries and the enormous price of those elective sur uh, surgeries, uh, have stopped uh, doing those. <laughs> Therefore, what shows up in GDP is not all of the real meeting of social needs that hospitals are doing in the face of this pandemic. What shows up is their loss of commodification. What, what I'm speaking to here, therefore, is it is not so much that the system is running out of its ability to survive. It's that the irrationality of the system, the chaos of the system, is being revealed in the face of this pandemic. We already see it almost every day in re relation to the uh, uh, ecological crisis the irrationality of the system. There's a, an article in the New York Times a few days ago, and I kind of pursued the inquiry a little further. Uh, the article in the New York Times uh, interviewed a doctor in British Columbia. I don't know if you saw this, but he had worked and taught at Harvard for 25 years. He, he's a healthcare economist, now in BC, a head of an institute of some kind there. And they were, the journalist was trying to find out how to compare the public health care system in British Columbia to Massachusetts and what were the difference in the stats. And this guy said that it, it was dramatic, the difference, because in British Columbia, where like in the rest of Canada, the hospitals are publicly owned. And this is a, a, a program, uh, the Canadian system goes beyond Medicare for all. It's not just public health insurance. It's publicly owned hospitals almost entirely. But in British Columbia, they were able to use central planning a sort of the term they used was command and control to allocate the hospital resources. So they could say, well, all the cancer patients are now going to go to such and such hospital and all the COVID cases are going to come to these hospitals. And it, why it has wound up across the country in Canada that on the whole, there's overcapacity for dealing with COVID crisis because there wasn't the profit motive to keep the beds filled with more profitable surgeries or uh, treatments. So Canada actually has not to the mostly faced any crisis in lack of beds. There has, of course, been a problem with lack of masks and gowns and stuff. 
So they, they looked at the difference between the um, morbidity rate in Massachusetts as compared with British Columbia. It was, I believe it was per thousand, and I'll have to check this. It might have been per 10,000. But the British Columbia, I'm sorry, Massachusetts, the morbidity rate as a result of COVID was 157. I think it was per thousand, but it might have been per 10,000, as I said. British Columbia was two. And it's the same across the country. And the, 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 it's essentially Canada has, when it comes to health care, central planning. But this is part of the irrationality of capitalism, as you just said. And it's being so exposed because it's killing thousands of people. And it's more and more pushing that there's going to have to be some kind of central planning, even like you're talking about the Roosevelt uh, type, type of direct federal work plan with massive in infrastructure program. Well, that's central planning. And the system's being pushed that way, but the people in power, especially in the United States, the class that's in power, and especially the Trump and the Republican Party and that whole sector, they absolutely don't want to go anywhere near what looks like central planning, unless it's central planning to subsidize themselves. Yeah, no, that's absolutely right. Although I think, you know, uh, living in Canada and, and knowing very well other public health systems, uh, there has been uh, uh, a lot of marketization in them and a lot of the introduction of what public health management experts call competition, even if they're not private, uh, in those sectors. It's also true in the university sector. In other words, neoliberalism introduced even within the social democratic states a degree of market competitiveness whereby you see this irrationality operating and, in the Canadian case, the enormous downloading by the federal government from the 1990s of its expenditure onto the provincial governments and then provincial governments downloading them onto municipal governments, we see plenty of, I have to tell you, irrationality even in this system. Now, that is not to say uh, that uh, the contrast is not worth drawing, uh, but it is real enough. Plus, you know, it, and in Britain, the great NHS, uh, which has been marketized up to its hilt uh, with competition introduced as its key principle for managing the thing. The greatest contradiction in the NHS is exactly what you're describing, because instead of having coherent planning, uh, what you have is competition uh, in order to create uh, allegedly greater efficiencies. In fact, what the Canadian case also shows, this is quite remarkable, you know, the vast majority, over 80% of deaths in Canada due to COVID have taken place in nursing homes for the elderly, over 80%. Which are privately the, owned. Well, they're not all privately owned. And what no, the vast show, majority are privately owned where the deaths have taken place. Hmm. The morbidity rate in privately owned ones is 10%, while in municipally owned ones, it's 3%. Uh, and, and, you know, you see in that context what the privatization uh, of health care has, has led to. Now, even in Canada, you know, Quebec has the largest number of cases and the largest number of deaths. And the reason for that, it just came out today, is that the Quebec hospitals uh, when they were feared, when they feared that they would be overrun uh, by uh, COVID-19 patients, let a lot of the elderly who were there for other reasons sent them back into or sent them to nursing homes. Those nursing homes, a lot of them were privately run, um, but whether they were nonprofits or not, have been starved of funds for some two decades. And uh, the, uh, the epidemic went rampant through them as they sent home people from the hospitals into these nursing homes. So you see the knock-on effect of a lack of planning. But this, you're right, we're right to be talking about this in the context of the healthcare sector. But the irrationality operates at the level of the economy and the state as a whole. 
And there's no way in which we can have a economic planning in this sector without being able to look at the need for public ownership much, much more broadly uh, in the financial sector and in the productive sector, which after all provides the hospitals with not only the protective equipment, but with the certain equipment that is needed for surgery. Uh, and, and, you know, for in that, and, and of course, so much of the private sector makes its profits off selling to the, to the public sector, whether it is public hospitals or whether it is the Defense Department. Um, uh, and, and, you know, the, the irrationality of public expenditure uh, for commodities that are produced for a profit, whether the people involved are greedy bastards or not greedy bastards, whether they're Warren Buffett rather than Larry Fink, uh, as you said, Paul, is not the issue. The issue is the irrationality of a system that has competition at its heart rather than democratic planning at its heart. If you look not that far into the future, the situation gets worse, not better, both in terms of unemployment, in terms of what's happening in other parts of the world. Um, and as I go back to the earlier question, how how much of this kind of stimulus that the Treasury, the Fed is doing, how long can they keep it up? Because we could be talking months and months, a year, and and then. It, and if if and it's just a, is there a point where the investor class actually starts losing some faith in the American T bill? But it's not like there's an alternative. That's right. We don't know. Uh, uh, we simply do not know. Uh, and I take the view that uh, it's not a matter of a solution being found because the system seizes up. Uh, if the system seizes up, it could just be, uh, you know, an uglier scenario. Uh, even if there's a recovery, and I don't think it's going to be a V-shaped recovery, but even if there is, the this has exposed the irrationality of the system. This has proven how right Sanders and Corbyn were. Corbyn was largely defeated after doing so well in 2017, defeated in 2019, on the basis now of the old Thatcherite argument being revised about how are we going to pay for all this stuff that Corbyn is promising. Huh. What he was promising isn't a fraction of what is already being spent by Boris Johnson's government. Uh, and imagine if he had been elected in 2019, how much better shape the National Health Service could have been in, would have been in, to cope with this crisis. Um, I, I think it, it's not so much a matter of whether it gets worse or not. I think it is a matter of this showing us how screwed up this system is and uh, how clear it was becoming to so many people even when unemployment was 3% in their support for Corbyn and Sanders, that this was the case, that the system was irrational as well as ever more egalitarian. Um, so it's, it's my expectation, actually, that out of this crisis, whether there is a recovery in six months or a year or two or whatever, that out of this will come a much greater clarity, a much greater openness on the part of more and more people to the democratic socialist case that was made before this crisis. And that, in fact, was being made before Trump's election and before Boris Johnson's election. 
Uh, I think that's where the hope lies. And I, you know, I don't want to be patting you too much on the back, Paul, but I think the kind of media that you have been doing and that the analysis.com is continuing is crucial and was crucial before this pandemic. And will be crucial even if they do manage to contain the contradictions that it has exposed this time. Crucial to building the kind of consciousness in working class people, very broadly defined, that uh, the way forward is a democratic socialist one. Now, that isn't going to take place without a lot of conflict, without a lot of class struggles. What are the terrible things that's happening uh, in Canada is that health and safety regulations are completely being ignored in the context of this crisis. There isn't one case of an appeal to a labor board around unsafe work that has been recognized in this crisis. Now, you can say Pete's lives are being saved. Uh, at what expense, especially on the part of poorly paid recent immigrant workers who are brought in to work in this sector uh, because they will take the low wages given the standard of living in their country compared to Canada. Uh, what we need to ensure is that what we get out of this crisis is a strengthened set of labor regulations. Uh, which will allow for the extension and the strengthening of trade unionism again. Without that shift in the balance of class forces, even an or a increased orientation to recognizing the need for the type of public measures that we're talking about will not go very far. We need to re rebuild a sense of class awareness, class consciousness, class identity, and class confidence in order to see this through. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, the people like Powell, the Federal Reserve, will put their fingers in the, in the dike. Uh, and, and they can be fairly effective at doing it. And they can even use outfits like BlackRock to make them effective at doing it, or outfits like General Electric to provide more per personal protection equipment. Uh, and, you know, we can marvel at their ability to put their finger in the dike. That's essentially what the state does. The state is either a firefighter or in the, when there's financial crises, or in, in this context, it's a ventilator. Uh, it's providing oxygen to a system that couldn't possibly survive when production ends. But what we need to do is build up the confidence of people to get behind a democratic socialist alternative. In the 1930s, in, 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 in a similar situation in the sense that the unemployment was so deep, in effect, I think we're already at higher unemployment numbers now than during the 30s, and we're certainly headed even higher. Um, the, many of the big capitalist countries had a kind of two roads to go down, uh, fascism or the kind of Rooseveltian solution, New Deal type solution. And even though there was a lot of support for fascism in the American elites, Roosevelt and that sections of capital that supported him uh, chose not to go that way and, and thought it was more in their interest to do the New Deal. Um, do the conditions for that exist within the American oligarchy? I don't see a Roosevelt in sight, and I don't even see a heck of a lot of talk for the kind of reforms that would be necessary to, to for that kind of new deal we hear about a new green new deal but we're not hearing it from anyone that might actually have some power to execute it well that uh remains to be seen uh, in the wake of this crisis it certainly is the case that the kind of you mentioned massachusetts before the kind of uh, aristocratic capitalists uh the boston brahmin uh who did uh help build state capacities of a capitalist kind. Indeed, helped create the Federal Reserve in, in 1912 after uh, they rely, had to rely on J.P. Morgan uh, to bail out the system in the crash of 1907. Uh, it is true that Roosevelt represented uh, and brought in further into the state the type of capitalists 
uh, who uh, could see that uh, it was in the system's own interest to have a state with capacities uh, of the kind that Roosevelt's administration built up even further uh, during the 1930s. Uh, and, and uh, you know, they are far fewer to be seen these days. That is certainly true. Uh, that is certainly true. Uh, that said, uh, let's bear in mind uh, that Wall Street did succeed in pressuring Roosevelt not to fully adopt a Keynesian strategy during the 1930s. He was oriented to balanced budgets. Uh, and, and by virtue of pulling back on a public expenditure after the 36 election, uh, he uh, uh, induced a, a second depression. Uh, and, and it was really only the war that led to the type of sustained public expenditure uh, that pulled the economy out of the depression. At that time, the main CEOs went to work for the state uh, at a dollar a day, a dollar a year, rather. Um, and their uh, productive capacities were turned towards uh, the war effort. That said, uh, there was nothing like the union involvement in uh, uh, that process uh, it, and those CEOs were always suspicious of even the Keynesians, let alone those who were more radical, in terms of uh, uh, a shift, uh, of making this a permanent shift. And we have to remember what came out of the Second World War. It was an informal American imperial state uh, that, yes, wasn't afraid of public expenditure, but explicitly saw itself as protecting the world from non-capitalist states that explicitly engaged its foreign policy and to a large extent its domestic policy uh, in terms of uh, opening up the world to capital accumulation and pro persecuting those who wanted to shift towards a socialist alternative. Uh, now, that's not to say that the New Deal uh, reforms didn't continue, although they did increasingly reach their limits in an increasingly capitalist economy uh, by the 1960s, let alone later, even before the ideological shift to Reaganism. The regulations of the banks were no longer effective once the banks went international with the development of the euro dollar market and the euro bond market by the 1960s. Once multinational corporations were investing abroad, uh, the, the regulations could be escaped. Uh, and increasingly, as we know, uh, the public health system, the public welfare system, uh, was replete with contradictions. And as it was replete with contradictions, some of that got picked up by profitable firms operating in those sectors. Uh, to the, uh, you know, to the effect of them being run on the base of profit and efficiency. Uh, and that led, of course, to the types of conflicts uh, and the types of irrational behavior on the part of the subordinate classes uh, that vastly expanded the size of the American prison system. Then you got a democratic president doing away with welfare as we know it. And as we know, when, and this is not a Republican president. Uh, and, it, you know, it was with the type of, you know, people in the Treasury and the, and the, the Federal Reserve who looked like Roosevelt's uh, Democratic liberals, Rubin and Summers, etc. You know, you do away with welfare offices and what fills up? Prisons. The state doesn't get smaller, it gets bigger. Uh, so it, we can't simply draw a contrast and say we'll go back to the New Deal. The limits of the New Deal, the fact that the New Deal did not introduce democratic economic planning, take the banking system into the public sector as a public utility, all of that, even during the war, all of that left the dynamics in place 
for us to be where we are now. And what I fear is that people think that if we go back to those reforms or get new ones, we're going to solve the problem. In fact, we need reforms. We aren't going to be able to get to socialism at one go. But we need the type of reforms that open themselves up to encouraging people to fight for further reforms rather than close off the system of reform and say, that's enough. And, and it's crucial that we look at strategically what needs to be done in the 21st century this way. I, I, when I interviewed Bernie Sanders, I asked him directly that I said, breaking up the big banks uh, doesn't, wouldn't that just lead to those sections of capital reassembling at some point is what happened with the big telecoms. And don't you really have to start talking about public banking? Banking is a public utility. And he agreed, but then he never talked about it again. He, yeah. He, he, and yeah. It seems to me it's 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 of all the things we need to be talking about this issue of one public ownership and two particularly on the issue in uh, sectors of finance, it's like the most critical that that if there's going to be, uh, uh, let's just go back to a, an earlier point for a, a minute. Larry Fink may have the best of intentions. He may be a perfectly lovely guy. This is the guy who's the head of BlackRock. BlackRock has no choice but to be an institution that does everything it can to maximize its return on investment. It can't do anything else. It is what it is. And that's true for the whole financial sector. Uh, without, without that banking as a public utility and without breaking the, uh, the hold the finance sector has, not just on economics, but on politics, the, 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 you know, finance, if you look at the top donors, for presidential candidates and almost all the down ballot races as well. It's almost all finance institutions, hedge fund guys. Um, I, I think this, this has to be brought even more to prominence in, in the discussion in, in progressive circles, the absolute necessity of advocating uh, public, uh, public banking, banking as a public utility, because this, these banks, you know, if Biden does get elected, uh, the banks are, and and if this crisis continues, these banks only survive because of public money. They don't survive any other way. No, I I totally agree. I think that's absolutely right. Uh, the the challenge for us is how do we do that? Uh, and I I have to say that that uh, very few of us left wing political economists uh, have tried to think through what banking as a public utility would look like. Uh, I've organized a number of panels over the last, last two decades, and one of them including uh, Bob Pollan, who you recently interviewed on theanalysis.com. Um, and, and Bob uh, has thought about this a lot and once did an absolutely wonderful uh, article on what it would take to democratize the Federal Reserve, uh, etc. Uh, but for the most part, I found uh, that there's very little thinking of this through, even on the part of the intellectual left. Uh, and we also need to recognize that there's very little state capacity for this. Um, one of the things that uh, Corbyn uh, and, and his chancellor of the Exchequer, uh, John McDonald, was, were, were talking about was taking the large banks that were taken into the public sector in 2008, bailed out and told to run on a commercial basis. The Royal Bank of Scotland, which used to be the National Westminster Bank, uh, and Lloyd's. Um, uh, and they were selling off portions of it. But rather than selling it off, turning those into a public utility and develop, using them to develop the capacity to be able to manage a financial system to have the knowledge and expertise because it's never just a matter of red it's also a matter of expert having the knowledge to be able to run the, the banking system as a public utility uh, now that's all the more difficult in light of the transnationalization of finance uh, and the role that private finance plays in uh, arbitraging trade because it isn't just uh, 
a matter of money chasing money. In fact, uh, what the financial system does with financial commodities is provide, it, it greases the wheel of the dealings in exchange rates uh, and in uh, trade uh, fi financing, uh, which is so necessary to the trade of goods and services, uh, not only financial commodities. Uh, and then insofar as having a publicly owned financial system, what is that about? It's about being able to have a degree of control over investment uh, and over leveraging lending for investment. Well, can you have that without capital controls? Insofar as money can simply flit out of the country, it isn't just a matter of public banking, it's a matter of capital controls. And this was being promoted by Harry Dexter White, who was later uh, uh, traduced as a communist sympathizer after the war, who was the senior official in the U.S. Treasury. He was proposing something more radical than Keynes did which is that if one country introduces capital controls after the war, all the other countries who would sign on to what became the Bretton Woods Agreement would have to help them police those capital controls. So if money escaped from Toronto to New York, it would be the responsibility of the regulators in New York to oversee that this wouldn't happen. This was never, of course, the Wall Street was strong enough, even during the war, not to allow for that. The United States didn't adopt capital controls after the war. It was the only country in the Bretton Woods framework that didn't. Uh, and, and, you know, these are the types of things that we need to get our heads around in order to be able to do this. So no one thinks we're going to be able to turn the financial system into a public utility overnight. But it does involve, insofar as we say the state bails out any of these firms, taking equity in these firms. And I think that should apply to productive firms as well. And using that equity, not to get the highest return, but using that equity in order to get the kind of people in there who would be able to shift the priorities, whether it's productive or financial firm, of that firm towards meeting public needs and learning while doing so the kinds of things that we need to know about how to run a productive corporation or a financial one in a way that does meet public needs. Uh, this is the kind of challenge before us. Uh, it isn't a small one. It's not a matter of coming up with a slogan, which I often myself do, because I think I was the one who coined turning the banking system into a public utility that trips easily off the tongue. But in order, to, in order to actually do this in a practical, strategic way, much more than this is required, uh, and we've got to start se selling, uh, set, setting ourselves this task. Um, that's the job of a serious media uh, that is addressing these questions uh, with people who are paid to try to think this stuff through uh, intellectually. Um, uh, and, and it, you know, this has got to be taken into uh, account in terms of the strategic capacities of democratic socialist movements. Uh, and, and you're right when you speak of Sanders making the case for breaking up the banks and agreeing that, in fact, the whole system needs to become a public utility. If all he's employing is people uh, who are good at reading the polls, uh, and being able to raise uh, $2.70 a day uh, through the social media and good at the need to be good at developing campaigning strategies, both through the social media and door-to-door. Uh, -door. They also need to be developing strategic ca capacities in how to change the state. Because it's not just a matter of having the right policies is having to have the capacity to think through what it would mean to implement those policies, both in terms of the enormous opposition from the capitalist classes that you've been talking about, but also in terms of how do you change the state apparatuses to be able to have that expertise rather than the expertise 
to put the finger in the dike, uh, which is what they primarily do. Leo, we're obviously going to keep this discussion going. Thanks very much for joining us. Paul, I would love to keep this discussion going with you. And thank you for joining us on the analysis.news podcast. Mm-hmm.